happen. Time to talk. Where is Cobblepot? Let me go! If you insist. Please, stop. Stop! I'll call him. I'll tell you anything you want to know. Please! Too late. I already have what I need. No! Next to Sony's Spider-Man games, the Batman Arkham series is the most successful superhero game franchise ever, at least in terms of sales. But if I asked you what the best Batman game is, it's unlikely that Batman Arkham Origins would be the first game to come to mind, if it comes to mind at all. So what happened? How do you go from selling 12 million copies with Arkham City to a game that a lot of people will tell you isn't worth playing? Origin shares a lot in common with other late 7th generation sequels, like God of War Ascension and, to a lesser degree, Dead Space 3. It's generally seen as being the weakest game in the franchise, criticised for being too similar to the earlier games and including an unnecessary competitive multiplayer mode. It wasn't made by series creator and respected developer Rocksteady either. It was made by the then relatively unknown Warner Brothers games Montreal. Origins was also plagued by a myriad of technical issues across all platforms at launch, from minor visual hiccups to game-breaking crashes and corrupt save files. All of these factors undoubtedly affected review scores, and while they weren't terrible, it received a number of 6s and 7s, and even some lower than that. This created the perception that it wasn't a good game, and a step down in quality for the series. Like a lot of games of this era that I've played recently for the first time, I don't think this is a bad game at all. In fact, I think in many ways it's on par with Asylum and City. It's true that it's incredibly similar to those games, and while sure, the lack of innovation might be disappointing, that doesn't mean that swinging around as the Dark Knight in Origins is any less entertaining. Sitting down to play it in 2023, after not having played an Arkham game since I finished Arkham Knight in 2015, was like a breath of fresh air. I'd forgotten how much fun it can be donning the cowl and patrolling Gotham's dark streets. God damn, has it really been almost 10 years? With Gotham Knights failing to create much buzz and Rocksteady's new DC superhero game seeming further and further away, now seemed like the perfect time to give Origins a second chance. So as usual, I'm going to take a look at the development history, the launch, the stupid amount of DLC it received, what it's like to play today, and what platform you should play it on. Finally, and probably most importantly, I'm going to tell you why it's worth your time. Origins is the only game in the Arkham series that wasn't developed by Rocksteady, who were busy working on Arkham Knight at the time. Warner Brothers didn't want to leave a four-year gap between titles, so Warner Brothers Games Montreal was given the reins. They were relatively unknown at this point, having only worked on a couple of browser-based games and the Wii U port of Arkham City. They would eventually go on to work on Gotham Knights, which is of course set in the same universe. Rocksteady wasn't directly involved in the game's development, but they did hand over their source code, telling Warner Brothers Games Montreal to make the game they wanted to make, so long as it fit within the canon of the Arkham series. This allowed them to build on the work that Rocksteady had already done, giving them a head start on development. Like with the previous games, Arkham Origins draws inspiration from the Nolan and Burton films, as well as from the comics. This game was heavily influenced by the DC series Legends of the Dark Knight, and also Frank Miller's graphic novel Year One. Ben Matz, a senior producer at Warner Brothers Games Montreal, describes this game as roughly year two of Batman's career. The reason they didn't think the year one story would work is because it would have been hard to translate it into an experience where you felt empowered. It would have also required a massive rethinking of the combat system and gadgets. Origins is essentially built on top of Arkham City's code, and deviating from the systems and mechanics in that game was going to require significantly more development time than they had. Although much of the game simply builds on what Arkham City did, a key area the team wanted to improve on was exposing players to the intricacies of the combat system. Based on data from Arkham City, it was clear that most players button mashed their way through the game, and were unaware of the depth available to them. An example of how they achieved this are the boss fights. According to Matz, they were inspired by the boss fight in Arkham City against Dr. Freeze. This boss fight demands that you use all of your knowledge of the combat system up until that point, and if you'd been leaning on the one mechanic to get by, you learnt the hard way that there was a lot more to the combat system than you originally thought. Origins boss fights are like a deconstructed version of this concept, with each one requiring a mastery of one of Batman's abilities. 
The villains chosen for the boss fights were selected specifically to test you in what is basically a final exam for each of Batman's skills. For example, Deathstroke requires you to master the parry, whereas Copperhead requires you to use your quickfire gadgets. This design philosophy that centers around the idea of mastering abilities wasn't just limited to the boss fights. You can see it in various other systems throughout the game, which challenged the player to learn everything the combat system has to offer. When it came to the story, this was the area that Warner Brothers Games Montreal had the most freedom. A prequel was chosen because it allowed them to explore a different kind of Batman, a more aggressive Dark Knight who doesn't always make the best choices, something that the other games weren't able to do. To help sell this new version of Batman, in what seemed like madness at the time, Kevin Conroy was deliberately not used for the voice of Batman because they wanted him to sound younger. Mark Hamill didn't reprise his role as the Joker either, for separate reasons, with industry veteran and omnipresent voice actor Troy Baker stepping in. Like so many games of this time, Origins includes a multiplayer and is the first and only game in the series to include one. It was developed by a separate studio, Splash Damage, who had previously worked on the multiplayer for a handful of Wolfenstein games, Doom 3, and the team-based shooter Brink. Origins launched on October 25th, 2013 for the PS3, Wii U, 360 and PC. The marketing for this game was pretty extensive. Along with the regular trailers and promotional posters, a companion game, Batman Arkham Origins Blackgate, was released at the same time for the 3DS and PS Vita. This would also get a PC and console port later in 2014. This is actually a quasi-sequel being set three months after the main game. In December of 2013, a digital comic with the same name that acted as a prequel was released. You had to purchase chapters individually, but if you bought them all, it unlocked two exclusive Batman costumes for the game. In addition, released prior to the game's launch, a free-to-play spin-off beat-em-up developed by NetherRealm, also called Batman Arkham Origins, was released for iOS and Android. This lets you unlock costumes for the console versions too by ranking up. There were also numerous collector's editions that included various collectibles such as figurines. NECA Toys even created a full-size working replica of the grapnel gun that was created using the 3D model from the game. At launch, most critics were unanimous in their praise of the game's visuals, voice acting and gameplay. The central criticism was that it failed to innovate and felt too similar to Arkham City. The story was also criticised for not being as cohesive as the previous entries, and it didn't help that the game shipped in an incredibly broken state. Almost every review mentions poor performance and numerous technical issues, many that prevented people from playing altogether. The game is estimated to have sold around 5 million copies across all platforms, which is far from a disaster, although this is less than half of what Arkham City sold just two years earlier. Stop! Black Mask! Put a bounty on my head! Where is he? I don't keep tabs on every geezer with a grudge! You're not a popular bloke in this town! Arkham Origins is a prequel to Arkham Asylum, set eight years earlier. The story follows a younger Batman, still figuring out what it means to be the Cape Crusader. This year two version of Batman is impulsive, violent, and determined to work alone. It gives us a look at his first encounters with a number of villains, such as Joker and Bane. Prior to this, he'd mostly been dealing with run-of-the-mill thugs, like gangbangers and drug dealers, and this marked a shift in the type of criminals he'd have to face moving forward. Drawing influence from Legends of the Dark Knight issue 79, with a nod to Batman Returns, Origins is set on Christmas Eve. The story starts out with Black Mask putting a $50 million bounty on Batman's head, and eight assassins setting out to take him down. This includes well-known villains like Deathstroke and Killer Croc, as well as a few lesser-known ones like Copperhead. The setup is excellent, and lays the groundwork for a number of awesome boss fights, which I'll discuss later on. Unfortunately, the story falls apart quickly, with a couple of twists taking it in a very different direction to where it started out. It'll take about 10 hours to complete, and by the end it kind of feels like it doesn't really go anywhere. You don't get a conclusion to some of the earlier threads, and although I like Batman's character arc, the rest of it comes across as a bit sloppy. The ending feels rushed too, like they knew where the story had to go, but didn't know exactly how to get there. It's hard to give a synopsis without going into spoilers, and there are some cool surprises. Look, it's not the best story in the series, and it's obvious they were hamstrung with where they could ultimately take it. It does manage to remain entertaining from start to finish, even if it doesn't completely satisfy by the time the credits roll. One of the main reasons for this is that the voice acting is top shelf. I wasn't sure how I felt about playing an Arkham game without Kevin Conroy as Batman, but Roger Craig Smith completely nails the part. If I hadn't read up on the game's development prior to playing, I never would have guessed that it wasn't Conroy. 
Nothing will ever replace his Dark Knight, those dulcet tones will forever be the standard by which everything else is judged, but I'd be happy to see Smith take on the role moving forward. Troy Baker as the Joker is surprisingly good, and Alfred in particular has never been more likeable. Actually, Alfred ended up being my favourite character. The central story is kind of all over the place, but it does a really good job of exploring the relationship between him and Bruce. He has some of the best lines too. Very funny, Alfred. Why, thank you. Just a few more remarks like that and I'll have earned my spot in the sarcastic butler's Hall of Fame. Believe it or not, there is a sequel of sorts, beyond what happens in Arkham Origins Blackgate. Batman Assault on Arkham is an animated movie that takes place two years before Arkham Asylum. It's supposed to bridge the gap between the two games, although it's more like, here's some things that happen in between that sort of loosely connect the two stories. It's not a direct continuation of Origins. It's okay. It's easily the most violent Batman animation I've seen, and it has some good action sequences. Most of the cast from the game are here too, including Nolan North's Fantastic Penguin, although Kevin Conroy is again Batman in this one. I feel like calling it mid is too harsh, but it's definitely not required viewing either. You want someone dead? Fill them with lead. It doesn't have to be some kind of stage show. You know that, I know that, but something tells me a man who this guy's crazy! Arkham Origins gameplay is every bit as good as Asylum or City. As usual, you'll spend a lot of time fighting henchmen with the occasional problem to solve and some light platforming. Or should it be batforming? Yeah, that was bad. The combat is really goddamn good. When you get into a flow, it's almost like playing a rhythm game, where it's more about button timing than memorizing combo strings. The game constantly reminds you what your options are, but there's still quite a bit of nuance to it like knowing the timing of parries and which attack is the most effective for the enemy you're currently dealing with. Some people argue that the combat in the Arkham games is too simplistic and repetitive, and I can definitely see how this is true if you simply stick to the basics. You can just mash out the same handful of attacks in almost every situation, which does feel incredibly monotonous, but in Origins this will only get you so far. The further in the game you get, the more you need to utilize the rest of Batman's abilities and tactics, especially stealth. Attacking groups head-on becomes less and less viable later in the game because enemies often have weapons like guns, and an increasing number of tougher enemies such as armoured enforcers and martial artists are thrown into the mix. Additionally, the focus system does a great job of adding a risk-reward component by providing increasing levels of bullet time and takedown options so long as you don't drop your combo. It's not Sifu levels of complexity, but there's enough depth and player expression for it not to be a simple button masher. And it's here that you can see the work put into educating the player on the finer points of the combat. The combat has its own ranking system too, called the Dark Knight system, where ranking up and completing criteria unlocks new gadgets and abilities. A lot of the criteria you need to complete will happen organically, just through playing the game, but some of them are quite specific, like needing to knock down two enemies with the slide. It never feels like a laundry list of arbitrary tactics that have no real practical application though, and it does a good job of encouraging you to explore the combat. I mean, I probably wouldn't have figured out how the focus system works, or realised that you can knock enemies down with the slide on my own. Batman's arsenal is pretty big, and mastery of it allows you to take out large groups of enemies more efficiently. Plus, it just looks fucking cool when you use all of his wonderful toys. You get experience points after each fight, which rewards you with upgrade points as you rank up. There's loads of stuff to unlock and upgrade, and it makes fighting random thugs on the street feel like it has a greater purpose. Unsurprisingly, the boss fights stand out because they're unique, and each one offers a different challenge. They serve as timely reminders that you should have mastered a specific skill by that point, and if you haven't, it's an opportunity to do so. None of them are quite as memorable as the Dr. Freeze fight from Arkham City, but collectively they're a high point. Having so many villains to fight is awesome, and that's not even counting all of the side quest bosses. I'll admit that these are less exciting, and the quality varies from must play to complete snooze fest. The good thing is that you don't have to do them. If you pick one and get bored, you can simply do something else. I had already done a couple of the side quest bosses by the time I finished the main story, and I still had only managed 27% overall completion. So yeah, there's plenty of other things to do. A common complaint is that the city is too big, and yeah, it's much bigger than Arkham City, twice as big in fact. This might sound like an odd thing to complain about with an open world game, bigger is usually better, but I'll tell you why it's not here. While it's awesome that the city feels large and dense, both in terms of geography and things to do, getting around becomes tedious quickly. Jumping off a building and gliding around in Arkham City for the first time felt liberating, and you initially get the same sense of freedom here too. After a while though, it becomes clear that it's just not a fast or easy way to get around. 
For starters, Batman doesn't stay airborne for long before he loses altitude, so you have to constantly find structures to relaunch yourself off, or dive bomb to build up speed, and it's really easy to bump into something and ruin your flow. Thankfully, there's a fast travel system. You will watch the same cutscene each time you use it, which presumably hides loading, but otherwise it's a pretty quick way to get around. Once you arrive at your destination, swinging between vantage points and swooping in for some sweet justice is just as satisfying as it's always been. It would have been cool if the animations could have been changed to reflect a younger, less refined Batman, but this is a minor gripe. As you'd expect with an open world game, the city is full of distractions. There's challenges, puzzles, side quests, things to collect, things to destroy, and so on. Yeah, okay, not everything feels like a good way to spend your time, and there's definitely more filler than killer. It's there if you like this sort of stuff though, and there's always something to do if you want to break from the campaign. It also means that there are likely to be plenty of activities remaining after the credits roll, and a lot of the unlockable stuff is dependent on completing them. Speaking of after the credits roll, it has a new game plus, and it even has a permadeath mode. This is the first game where the primary Batcave makes an appearance in the campaign as a playable area. It's a pretty sweet space to wander around and check out Batman's stuff. It also has a training area where you can practice various combos, abilities, and try out gadgets. There aren't a ton of new weapons over what Arkham City has, but the remote claw is a lot of fun. It's kind of like the grappling hook from Just Cause that can be used to tether two things together, like enemies to enemies and enemies to things that go boom. On the other hand, I have mixed feelings about the shot gloves. I agree with the criticism that they're easy mode, and I think they could use a balance. Like, maybe they're a bit more difficult to charge, and or they don't last as long. Occasionally though, you just want to finish a fight quickly, and they do give you the option to mindlessly mash your way to victory. Even still, it's a pretty challenging game on normal, and it's got to be one of the few times where the difficulty description feels accurate. Origins also introduces the reconstruction of crime scenes that would later appear in Arkham Knight. The concept isn't fully realized here because there isn't really any detective work to do. You just look at the red triangles and hold a button for exposition. Still, it adds something different into the mix. Warner Brothers Games Montreal did an amazing job with teaching you how the various systems and mechanics work and for rewarding you when you use them. I guess the issue is that for diehard fans and probably a lot of critics too, this was stuff they already knew. So the work that went into making sure players were exposed to everything the game had to offer was lost on them, and this may have been why the game was criticized for feeling very similar to the previous games. For new players though, Origins is the most accessible game in the Arkham series, and if you were someone who mashed your way through the earlier titles, I'd recommend giving this a go. Oh crap. Uh oh, Batman, hurry! Someone's about to get shot! Multiplayer has two modes. Invisible Predator allows two teams of three thugs to battle it out in team deathmatch style matches. The unique component of this mode is that two people play as Batman and Robin to try and take out thugs, essentially turning it into a three team asymmetrical competitive mode. Hunter x Hunter is very similar, except that it gives thugs guns, removes respawning, and removes Robin. Unfortunately, the servers for the multiplayer were officially retired in 2016 for PC and Xbox. The PS3 multiplayer apparently worked for a bit longer according to a few sources, for reasons known only to Jim Ryan, although it appears to be offline now. Modders restored the PC version a little while back, so if you don't mind jumping through a few hoops, it should be possible to get a game going on PC. I never got a chance to play it, but according to many who did, it was a fun time, even if it was incredibly light on content. Origins has a bat ton of DLC, and it's super messy as well. There were all kinds of pre-order bonuses and exclusives, like the Deathstroke pre-order DLC and the PS3 Nightfall pack. Like a lot of games at the time, it has a season pass that gives you five of the DLC packs. It costs $29 Australian, and while it does bundle a lot of the game's DLC, it, like a lot of season passes back then, doesn't contain everything. The other issue with the DLC is that because of all the exclusives, it's impossible to get everything on the one platform. Some of it is inaccessible now as well, like some of the skins that could only be unlocked by the digital comic or companion game, neither of which exist anymore. This is one of the many reasons why a remaster that contains everything is badly needed. I guess the one saving grace is that not all of it is necessary. Like, you can probably make it through the rest of your life without the one million suit. If more game is what you want, and not just fancy new pants for Batman, there are two pieces of DLC that stand out. Initiation serves as a prequel to the story that shows Batman traveling to an ancient Korean castle that looks nothing like the temple from Batman Begins, where he trains with Kirigi to learn the ancient art of ninjutsu. This is basically a bunch of new challenge maps strung together with cutscenes. It's not exactly a campaign, but it does have three possible endings. 
Cold Cold Heart is the one to get if you want a proper expansion. It has some new environments like Wayne Manor, some new toys, new side activities, and it arguably has the best Batman suit too. It details Batman's first encounter with Dr. Freeze as well as his origin. I think Victor Freeze is such an interesting character and they've done such a good job with this DLC. It's so much more satisfying than the main campaign when talking about story. It's a decent size in terms of scope and length, although the entire Gotham map isn't available and you can't take the new suit into the regular game. This makes it a standalone experience and I think it would have been better if it was integrated into the main game. Still, it has some awesome encounters that culminate in a face-off with Dr. Freeze. It's not as interesting as the one from Arkham City, but it's still a cool boss fight. All in all, it's an excellent expansion that's well worth your time. Back in 2013, people thought this game looked incredible, and on PC it still can. The console ports are definitely less impressive by today's standards, and less impressive still if you've played Arkham Knight. It's kind of wild to think that these games are just two years apart. I guess the main issue here, at least on the older machines, is that along with the typical 720p resolution, certain elements of the presentation and the game's performance don't hold up. The shadows in particular look pretty shit, and the PS3 has some occasionally interesting texture issues. Overall, it doesn't look terrible, and yeah, a 10-year-old game running on ancient hardware is likely to look dated. I just don't think it's on par with other games from this period. I mean, I just played through Dead Space 3, and that still looks great on the old machines. Link to my review below the like button. What does still hold up is the excellent score. The Arkham games have always had great music, and Origins is no different. Unlike the previous games, the score was handled by Christopher Drake, who's worked on other Batman projects like Batman Gotham Knight. The standout has got to be the way that Carol of the Bells has been worked into the start screen music. It's absolutely perfect. As far as performance is concerned, the older machines are capped at 30 frames per second. The 360 hits the frame rate target the most consistently, where the PS3 struggles a bit while traversing city areas, and sometimes during combat. And you've probably noticed some of this in this video because I played through on the PS3. The Wii U is apparently a bit of a mess when it comes to both performance and visuals. Screen tearing is sadly pretty frequent, although nowhere near as bad as something like Asura's Wrath or Space Marine. Again, this is less of a problem on the 360, which brings us to the question, what is the best way to play it today? The short answer is PC. It can run the game at 4K and much higher frame rates, and there are all kinds of mods that improve the visuals as well as adding new content. Unfortunately, Warner Brothers seemingly pretends Origins doesn't exist, with it being left out of both the remastered collections, Return to Arkham and the Arkham Collection so PC is really the only modern way to play it. Now you can run the Xbox 360 version on the newer machines via backwards compatibility. There's no performance boost, but you should get a more stable frame rate and a higher resolution image. You can run the PS3 version via emulator. This lets you up the frame rate and resolution, although outside of the exclusive content, I can't see any other reason to emulate it. Like a lot of older games I review on this channel, I played through on the old hardware and specifically the PS3, and there's a couple of reasons for this. Firstly, I like to see what these games played like back in the day, warts and all. Secondly, it's often a very cheap way to play them outside of illegal downloads and emulation. And lastly, I've never been into playing on PC. I get that you have far more control and there's better visuals and performance, but I just like the plug and play simplicity of console gaming. The PS3 version is still playable, but it's the least optimal choice. Unless, of course, you have a Wii U and want to see the game running at sub 20 frames per second. Now, regardless of the platform, you'll need to update the game. At launch, there were all kinds of bugs and performance issues across all platforms, but the most egregious of these was a bug that corrupted game saves. So yeah, get the latest patch. Even after updating, I ran into occasional issues, including crashes, enemies floating through surfaces, and momentary freezing in some of the menus. It's a lot better than at launch, but it's still the buggiest game in the series. It never hits the narrative heights of the first two games, and it doesn't do much to push the series forward on the gameplay front, but I reckon it's every bit as fun to play as Arkham City. The take on a younger Batman allows the story to stand apart from the other Arkham games, and the performances from the cast throughout are excellent. The story is a bit messy due to the fact that it can't seem to decide on a direction, and it just kind of ends without much explanation. 
It's still entertaining from start to finish though, and the combat, exploration and side quests live up to the high standards the series is known for. It's a shame that Warner Brothers don't think it's worthy of a remaster or even porting it to modern hardware because your options for playing it in 2023 are pretty limited. It runs well enough on the 360 and PS3, although you can't help wonder what it would look like at a native 4K, 60 frames per second or higher, and proper 4K textures. The PC version comes close to this, especially when modded, and is probably your best bet for the most modern version. Otherwise, the last gen versions are playable, not including the Wii U port. If you enjoyed the other games in the series, including Arkham Knight, and you just want more of that, then this absolutely delivers.